Let's recall what we did last time. So we we finished the introduction and and started the the first part, uh, the most classical problem in extremal graph theory, the um, Turan type problem. So. Let's recall. Last time what we did, we um, mentioned this classical problem results of Erdős and Sekeres in Ramsey theory, finding long monotone sequences using this um, very useful pigeonhole argument. And then we talk about uh, another very, another classic, um, the Sperner theorem. Through this LYM inequality and the proof was done by double counting, double counting. And we'll also illustrate how we can do it in the probabilistic way, so probabilistic counting. Um, then we started this extremal graph theory part, officially introduced the extremal number of a graph H. And we've seen this result for Mentel theorem when H is a triangle, three vertex complete graph. Uh, and then um, we've, we saw the famous Turan theorem. So Turan's theorem says, um, in this extremal number, terminology, the extremal number of the complete graph on R plus one vertices, R at least two, is at most um, one minus one over R, n squared over two. So that's Turan's theorem. Um, there is a, uh, this is the easy, uh, weaker version, the stronger version says furthermore, we have the uniqueness of the extremal graph. Um, the Turan graph on M vertices with R parts, uh, complete R part type balanced uh, graph, this Turan graph is the unique maximizer, is the unique extremal graph. Okay, I left as exercises to work out two different kind of proofs, extending the ones that we've seen in, in Mantel theorem. And then we gave a third proof, a very nice combinatorial idea of ZCOP, this symmetrization proof. So today we're gonna continue with two more proofs of Turan's theorem. Um, the first one, so today, proof four, we're going to see symmetrization, but uh, given by Moskin and Strauss. So today, Moskin Strauss symmetrization. So this can be viewed as, before I mention this, this can be viewed as a continuous version or an analytic version of Zcop symmetrization. Um, okay, so let's see this proof. Before the proof, let's recall some basic linear algebra and introduce the key concept in this uh, continuous analytic version by Moskin and Strauss. So the key concept is the one called Lagrangian, Lagrangian of the graph. So um, before defining it, let's um, recall some basic linear algebra. So given the graph, we have a graph G 
uh, we can def we can associate to G a very useful matrix, a symmetric zero one matrix. Symmetric zero one matrix called adjacency matrix. Okay, I will not write down the formal definition. Let's say the vertex set of G is the vertices from one to N, give them name, one to N labeled. Then this adjacency matrix, basically we have rows and columns indexed by the vertices one to N. And um, you put one at entry IJ, let's say this is I and this is J. At this entry, we put a one. If and only if, um, so let's call this adjacency matrix A with entries A, I, J, I, J in N, right? You put the uh, A, I, J, this entry is one, if and only if I, J is an edge in the graph. So this is symmetric because if I, J, if I, J, mm, the picture is not so good. Uh, this is I and J. Okay. So we put the one if and only if they form an edge. So if I J is an edge, then of course J I here in a symmetric position, you should also have a one. And we have diagonal zero because there's no loop at each vertex. No vertex is adjacent to itself. This is zero one symmetry matrix, recording all the information of the graph. And um, in this way, so sometimes I will just write A, but we should write A sub G to indicate that it's the adjacency matrix of G, but I might omit G when it's clear what the underground, what, what, what the underlying graph G is. So let's consider Let's consider this quadratic form lambda g of x. x is a vector. So you take a vector x, which takes value, uh, uh, length and vector. This quadratic form is basically uh, give you a weight one half. I'll explain in a little bit why we put one half and a, and um, so it should be a sub g. But I will I will skip writing g and times x. This is the quadratic form. Okay. Um, this is called the Lagrangian function of a uh, of a graph g. Okay. Uh. So what is this thing? Let's write it out. This equals to sum one half, sum of ij in n, um, xi, xj times aij. By the definition of matrix multiplication, uh, but Remember, this is the adjacency matrix. We can forget about all the zeros. So if ij are not adjacent as an edge, we can forget about this term. So we only keep the terms that ij form an edge. And for every edge, it's considered twice. Right? You have multiplied by one, considered twice, because ij is considered once, and ji considered once. Divided by two, so that means this equals to sum over all ij as an edge of G, X, I, X, J, right? A, I, J equal to one, so it disappear. One half also goes away because now we only count index by the edges, not by I, J independently, uh, separately. So now we can define the, the Grangian of the graph.
The ground region of G is defined to be lambda G. Okay, equals to the supremum of all X in this simplex. Let me define it in a little bit. Um, lambda G X. So what is this simplex? This is the n-dimensional simplex, which is just all x vector in Rn, such that um, x each coordinate is non-negative. And um, sum of xi is 1. So let me draw a picture. Uh, in do I need to draw a picture? In a, yeah, this should be clear. I will not draw this picture. So this is the simplex. Every coordinate is not negative. The sum of the coordinates equals to one. And we we take the supremum over all lambda g of x over this set. So let's explain maybe a little bit. What does this Lagrangian of G means? Well, it, it basically, um, this is basically the number of edges if you take a weighty version of G. So it basically, this basically is the number of edges in a weighted blow up of G. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at this one here. This is the definition, right? Let me write it out again. Lambda G X equals to sum of X I X J. I J is an edge of G. Okay. So, if you put, um, so here's just try to understand this thing. If you put x to be the all one vector, all one vector, then you record each summoned is one. Uh, yeah, n minus one dimension. So you um if we if every entry of x x is all one vector so every summon is one you sum over all edges that's precisely so i don't know what's the convention maybe call this all one vector j uh is that the convention so if if, if let me not write this if this is all one then lambda g of x is precisely e of g, okay? And um, why we consider this simplex n minus one dimension one? Because we can think of uh, x, this every, ver every vector x in this simplex corresponds to, there is a correspondence, every vector here corresponds to a weighty blow up of g. Okay, let me write it. An X in this simplex corresponds to a weighted version of G. Okay. Um, because we can think of reweighting, you have originally, let's say your graph G looks like this. Now let's say I take X to be um, 0 0.1. I take X to be, you have five coordinates, right? So one fifth, one tenth, three ten, one fifth, one fifth. 
Okay, you have these five coordinates. So it just means, let's say this is vertex one, two, three, four, five, just to give an example. That means you give um twenty percent of the weights here, uh ten percent of the weights here, thirty percent here, twenty percent here, twenty percent here, right? You make a weighty version and you add all edges in between. A weighty blow up. And the number of edges, as you imagine, what's the number of edges between these two? This is 0 0.2 times 0 0.2. The weight of this edge is the product of the weight of vertices, 0 0.4. Oh no, 0 0.04, right? So you get a you get a number of edges in this weighty graph. So so lambda g of x in general, if x is in this, is precisely the number of weighty edges in this weighty version. Just to get some feeling. Good. So now with this preparation, we can prove, state and prove Moskin-Strauss symmetrization. Any questions so far? So here's Moskin Strauss says that in this language, given the graph, so let G be a graph um, for any M vertex graph G with click number, uh, let's say. Kr plus one free. Okay. Um, and for any x, a vector in this simplex. Okay, that's the hypothesis. Then I can always find, no matter what x other people give us, we can always find another vector inside this simplex. Here is this the y inside the simplex, such that you satisfy the, the two condition. First of all, um, we do not decrease this Lagrangian of the graph G. So lambda of G of Y is at least as large as lambda G of X. So what does it mean? As a weighty version, as a weighty graph, blow up of G, the y weighted one has more edges, at least as many edges as the x weighted version. Second of all, just have the first condition is th there's no meaning here because I can simply take y to be x. Then this is trivially true, right? We need some structural information about y. So we do not decrease the Lagrangian. And in addition, we know that the support of y So support of y, support of a vector is simply the the uh, the set of coordinates where y is non-zero. So this is the set of non-zero coordinates of a vector y. Okay, and the support of y induces click or complete graph. Click is complete graph in G. Okay. And um, in particular, We can then compute the supremum of this Lagrangian uh, equals to one half uh, one minus one over r. Okay. So why is this? 
why is this um, a proof of Turan's theorem? First of all, let's derive Turan's theorem. That's really quick, very simple. So we can fit in here. Well, as I said, this Lagrangian is the number of edges in this weighty version. So let's just consider this particular vertex, uh, 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 a vector, which is one over n constants on all coordinate. You take the transpose of this. We consider a column vector, right? So if you do this, then the Lagrangian with respect to this ve ve vector is precisely e of gx, but what is e of gx? It's the number of edges of g divided by n squared, okay? And by definition, this is at most the Lagrangian of g, which is one half, one minus one over r. So we recover the weaker version of Turan's theorem that e of g, if it's kr free, plus one free, then it's at most one half, one minus one over r times n squared, okay? So let's prove this one. Any questions so far about the statement? Uh, professor, uh, I I want to know why x kick in simplex delta power in minus one. Oh, this is the this is the definition of the simplex. Uh, so if it's n minus one dimension, it's actually a yeah. length n vector. I I see a uh, theorem in the theorem. Why we take x from x from uh, simplex data or uh, one? So you can actually, um, it doesn't have to be. You can always rescale it. You can always normalize it so that it lives in the simplex. So writing in this way just in for concreteness and for simplicity. You can take any any weighted function and you can normalize it, right? After normalization, it lives in the simplex. It's not necessary to answer your question. Oh, thanks. Okay, so the idea of this version, well, we've seen how we derive Turan's theorem, very simple. So how do we prove this? The idea is this is similar as in Zikov's theorem. So in z -Corp, we say that if you have two vertices, non-adjacent, if one has more degree than the other, then you symmetrize them by uh, making the one with less degree look like the one, look exactly the same as the one with higher degree, right? So you, sim you make them look the same. But now let's think of as, let's think of, so yeah, remember, in z -Corp's version, if you have two vertices, their neighborhood are different, then we make one look like the other, right? If this one is smaller, we delete it and, and, and make it look like that. But what does this mean analytically? That means we are changing the weight of the ver vertex weight of the graph G, right? So initially, we have this equal weight. Let's normalize it. So every weight is one over N. You have N vertices, right? If you make this vertex look like that, what it essentially did is simply we move the weight one over n from this vertex to this vertex, right? That's exactly what it did. And, and that's what we're gonna do in most King's drops. So we're gonna say that if we're gonna choose a, a vector y with minimum support, and if the support is not inducing a click, meaning that in the support there are two coordinates corresponding to two vertices that are not adjacent, we can always move weight from one coordinate to another without decreasing the Lagrangian. Uh, that's the idea, okay? So let me write down. Idea is is um, a mass transportation okay so
uh, as I said, if um, x has mass on two coordinates that are uh, two coordinates that corresponds to uh, two vertices not adjacent, then what we're going to do, if this happens, then we're going to move weight from one coordinate to another without decreasing. lambda g okay and eventually this will lead to a vector whose support is a clique here's a detail well <clears throat> so how are we going to choose the initial vector y so remember we start with an arbitrary vector x and arbitrary graph g that's kl plus one free let's choose uh, how do we find this y? Let's choose y to be the one that satisfies the first condition, which is a non-empty set of vectors because x itself satisfies this condition, right? You can put x here. So among this non-empty set, we can choose one satisfying this. And additionally, it has minimum support size. Okay, so we, we know we can do this. Now we're going to prove that this y with minimal support uh, is the, the vector that we desire. Uh, in other words, so we will show, we should prove that the support of y uh, induces a click. A complete graph. So suppose by contradiction, suppose um, y uh, is, is not a clique, suppose there exist two vertices not adjacent. Okay, here I, I skip writing uh, more precisely. Is this two vertices in corresponding to some two coordinates in the support of y? Okay that are not adjacent. Without loss of generality, by relabeling if necessary, let's assume these two vertices are, say, the vertex one and vertex two are not adjacent, okay? One, two, it's not an edge, and one, two is in the support of Y. Remember, we label the vertices from one to N. Now, um, we're gonna move weight, okay? How do we move weight? Well, basically, what does it mean moving weight? So we initially have a vector y. If we're gonna change to y plus x, or y plus z, where z looks like this, you have z is a vector. You have z, negative z, zero, 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 zero. What does this mean? This move means we move um weight from uh, vertex two to vertex one okay and the amount of this weight is z yeah 
we move minus z from vertex two, move it to plus z in vertex one. Okay, so let's analyze how moving this weight affect the Lagrangian. So lambda g of y plus z. This is after you move it, right? Let's write it in terms of matrix form. It's simpler. One half, a matrix form, matrix form is y plus z transpose the adjacency matrix of the graph g times y plus z, right? Now let's expand this equals to one half. You take the diagonal term first, this term, and the cross term, right? Cross term, the two of them, z, y, and y, z, they look the same. So you can sum them up. You have one half y transpose a y plus um, one half times two times z transpose a y plus one half z transpose a z. So what is the first term? The first term is precisely the Lagrangian of with respect to y. Second term, that just cancel one half and two. Let's leave it as it is here. Let's look at the third term. Third term is zero, actually. This equal to zero. Because what is this? This is the sum of z, i, z, j. i, j is an edge, right? Um, but z, i, z, j, all coordinates are zero except the first and second coordinates. So this equals to just z1, z2. I mean, I mean, the only possible term is z1, z2, but z1, z2 is not the term. It's not the summon here because one and two are not adjacent by our assumption. So this is actually zero. There's no summon here. All right? So what that says is that the quadratic term vanish. What we left is the original Lagrangian plus a function of z, this little z, this number. It's a linear function in z. So this is a linear function in z. What does it mean? That means a linear function is tilted like this, right? So that means you can move either from vertex one to two, one direction or the other direction. One of the di direction will not, one of the direction will be at least zero, right? You will not decrease this value, lambda value, okay? So that means, so this is a linear function, which means linear means um, we can choose z such that um, lambda g y plus z is at least lambda g of y, okay? Which is at least lambda g of x by our assumption, by our choice of y, right? So we obtain a new vector that's at least lambda g of x. And remember, y plus z is also living in the simplex, right? Um, we can choose z so small, smaller than um, the minimum of y1 and y2, so that when you minus z, you will not get a negative number. So you can guarantee every coordinate is non-negative. And the sum of coordinates because the sum coordinate of z is zero, it's not affecting the sum of coordinate of uh, everything. So still leaving the simplex. But now, um, and we can we can choose z. So in fact, let me, why, why not write it out? Let's just write z to be the minimum of y1 and y2.
Mm, I have to be careful with the sign. Okay, I'll leave it for you to write it out exactly what it is. But you can choose, you just keep moving weights from one to another until one of the coordinate y1 and y2 become zero. Okay? And this is always maintained. So what it means is that uh, what it means is that we can choose a proper Z so that we satisfy these and the support of Y plus Z is a proper subset of support of Y. Okay. Um, this contradicts to contradiction to the minimality of support of y. Remember, we choose y satisfying this condition with minimum support. But now we find another one also leaving the simplex, also satisfy this condition with a smaller support. Finishing the proof. Any question? Okay, so let me give um, two exercises. This uh, Moskin Strauss is quite useful technique. And there is some reason variation of this classical Turan problem. Uh, we can use this, you can just modify this Moskin Strauss proof and try to prove this uh, local version of the. This is fairly recent development, local. Uh, Turan's theorem, local version of Turan's theorem. Okay, this is independently by um, Bredich, Tomago Bredich, and Maletsen, Tomkin. So, what is the local version? Well, let me write it out first. So, prove that. For every m vertex graph G, then we have the sum of all edges in the graph G. You give it the weight. The weight is k of e over k of e minus one is at most n square over two, where this. K of E is the size of largest clique or complete graph in G containing the edge E. Okay. This is called local version because um, if we put the KR plus one free condition, that's exactly two round theorem hypothesis, right? Then KE is always, you have a global upper bound on KE. KE is at most R. The largest click, click containing any edges are because your KR plus one free. But in this local version says, okay, we don't need global uh, condition on having a not having a large click. If you can have local information of how large click an edge is containing, is containing, then you can get um, this version, which implies the original version. So try to prove this exercise. Um, there is a second exercise. So if you notice that I didn't finish the proof actually, I proved everything I prove this part, right? I prove that the support of Y induces a clique, but I didn't prove that uh, the Lagrangian, the supremum is taken uh, is, is, is the, 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 the supremum is this value, okay? So prove the in particular part. 
So this amounts to proving that the int particular the in particular part amounts to proving the following exercise, okay? Another exercise. Prove that the Lagrangian, the supremum, over all uh, vectors in the simplex of the R vertex complete graph equals to one half, one minus one over R, okay? Prove this, it's simple Cauchy swat. Any question so far? Okay, so let's move on to um, the last proof we will see at the moment, the fifth proof, a uh, probabilistic proof of Turan's theorem. Proof five, um, probabilistic proof by Carol and Wei. Mm. Okay. For well, this, let's uh, recall a, a key definition. Uh, this definition is uh, the independence number of a graph. We say a set S in the vertex, a subset of vertices S is independent set if it induces no edges, right? So if E G S is zero, if S induce no edges, no edge. And the independence number of a graph independence number of G denoted by half of G is the size, this is the size of largest independent sets in G. Okay. So you look in G, you find the largest set of vertices in which there's no edge at all and the number of vertices in this set is the independence number. And Carroll and Wei prove in this language that for any graph G, we have um, alpha of G, the independence number is at least the sum over all vertices in the graph, one over the degree of the vertex plus one. Okay, it gives a lower bound on the independence number of the graph G. Okay, if a lower bound means we need to construct an independent set with this size, right? And since independence number is the size of large in, in, largest independent set, then as long as we can construct the independent set of this size, we are done. And that's how we prove it. And we're going to construct this independent set probabilistically, this so-called first moment method. And we've seen this method in the introduction part last week when we proved this lower bound construction for Ramsey problem. So we don't explicitly construct such an independent set. We prove that with positive probability, there exists the independent set of this size. So this is so-called first moment method. First moment means we're going to utilize the first moment, which is nothing but the expectation of some random variable. And let me briefly mention this first moment method. It basically, the, the essence is that if we have a random variable x, Okay, if we can prove that the random variable x is 
less than or equal to k or equal to k. Um, I don't know which one. Let's say it equals to k. Uh, then what we prove is that there exists an outcome. There exists a possibility of uh, events of x where x is at most takes value at most k. There exists the outcome of x taking value at most k, right? If the expectation of some random variable is exactly k, then sometimes it exceeds the expectation, sometimes it must be below, right? You cannot have always x strictly bigger than k. In that case, expectation should be strictly bigger than k. And that's the idea. So in this language, right? That's how we do the Ramsey thing. So try to recall the Ramsey lower bound construction and fit it into this framework. So now, how do we use this here? We're gonna construct a random independent sets, I, okay? And let X to be the size of this random independent set. So X is a random variable. We're gonna prove that the expected size of this random of X, which is the expected size of this independent set is exactly this value, okay? And that means there exists the outcome that's at least, uh, okay? And respectively, there exists one with value at least k, right? There's one at most the expectation and there's one at least the expectation. Proof. Mm. Any questions so far? So as I said, let's consider how do we take this random independent set? Uh, we will not specify the distribution of random of this independent set directly. Uh, let's make use of a permutation of the vertices. So take a permutation of M vertices of the vertex set of G, uniformly are random. Consider a uniform random permutation sigma um, of vertex set of G. Okay, so you have vertices of G one to N, you uniform the random permute it in, in a uniform way. Now we're gonna define a set. Define set I, this is a set of vertices to be all the vertices V in G such that V precedes all vertices in its neighborhood, NV. Okay, let me draw a picture. So we have in this order, right? In this order, you have, this is image sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, sigma N. Let's say you have N vertices. You uh, this this ordering is already permuted under the random permutation sigma. Now we're gonna put what is this i? We're gonna take a vertex v, put it in i, only when all its neighbor under this permutation, the neighbor of this is neighbor of v, right? These guys, they come after V in this ordering, okay? Then we take it. 
um, let's do another one. Yeah, you take this one when all its neighbor comes after. Okay. But if, uh, okay, that's the definition. The first observation is that I by choice is an independent set. In other words, I there's no two vertices in I that are adjacent to each other. Why? Well, suppose we have two vertices in I, two blue vertices that we, we throw in I that are adjacent, linked by an edge. Yeah? What does that mean? So you have a vertex V that's adjacent to some vertex U, both of which are in I. Then let's look at the vertex U that's after V in this ordering sigma. Then U does not precede all its vertices, all its neighbors, right? One of the neighbors of U, which is V, is comes before U itself in this ordering. Some of it after one of them in front, right? So that means U cannot be included in I by definition. That's a contradiction. Now, all we have to do is to, so suffice is to show the expectation of the size of I is precisely V in V of G, one over D of V plus one. Okay, if we show this, then remember this first moment methods. If we show this, then we know there exists an outcome of I such that the size of I is at least its expected value, which is at least these. And alpha of G is, of course, at least the size of these random independent sets, right? As then, there exists I such that half of G is at least size of I, at least expectation of I, which is at least, which equals to this value, and we are done. So, and, and this is easy to compute, the expectation. Expectation of I is what? Is the sum, by definition of expectation, sum of all vertices in G, the probability that V is included in I. That's the expectation. But what is the probability that V is included in I? Let's recall the definition. We include the vertex V in I if and only if V comes before all its neighbors in this ordering. Okay. How many vertices here? The total number of vertices, if you look at V, is precisely D of V plus one. The number of neighbors is D of V plus one, which is V itself. So among this many vertices, V has to come first. And since sigma is a uniform random ordering, when you restrict it to this D plus one vertices, it's again uniform random permutation of this D plus one vertices. That means the probability that V comes first among these D plus one vertices is precisely one over the number of vertices. And that's it. This is this guy. Same thing. Okay, here, this is because sigma is uniform random ordering or permutation.
Any question? Okay. Good. If there's no question, we're going to move on to um, the next theorem, which is considered as the fundamental theorem in extremo graph theory, the early stone theorem. Okay. Erdős Stone Theorem. Which is considered as the fundamental theorem. In extremo graph theory. So what is Erdős Stone Theorem? Let's recall. We have Turan's theorem telling us what's this number, right? This is maximized by this. Um, so Turan's theorem basically, let me record it here, says that the extremal number of the complete graph Kr plus one is roughly um, one minus one over R n squared over two plus minus some term that's independent of n, actually linear in R, it's some constant term. So he has, uh, an, an, and he proved that the unique maximizer is the Turan graph. The next natural question is, what if we don't forbid clique? What if we don't forbid complete graph? What if we forbid the generic graph, some, some, some graph H? Can we still estimate this number, the extremal number? And early Stone theorem says, uh, gave a, a satisfying answer to this general problem. It basically resolved um, the problem of determining the extremal number of generic graph, a general graph H for all non-bipartite H. So let's write down the results of early stone. Um, early stone, 1946, not much uh, after Turan's theorem. Turan's theorem is 1941, I think. So it says that for any graph H, we have the extremal number of H is determined by another very central graph parameter in, in graph theory, the chromatic number of H equals to one minus one over chi of H minus one plus little one uh, n square over two plus minus, okay? So if you don't know little o, big o, little omega, big omega notation, um, it's better to <laughs> look up on Wikipedia and, and try to understand it. Last time I already been using it and we will keep using this notation. It's cleaner to write things this way. But let me just illustrate one more time. What do I mean by writing little o here? Okay. So formally, this just means, and I will write it once. In the future, I will not write this formally. But in the note, we should write uh, rigorously. So uh, rigorously, it just says that for any epsilon, what happened for any epsilon bigger than zero 
and for any h um there is list n0 that depends on epsilon and h okay then the following holds for any n at least n0 what the extremal number of nh equals to 1 minus 1 over kind of h minus 1 plus minus epsilon n squared over 2. And this plus minus just means a plus minus b means I say x equals to a plus minus b means x is at most a plus b at least a minus b, okay? So, remark, an important remark, well, okay, I have not, let's maybe, just to be safe, recall the definition of this chromatic number. So, uh, given the graph H, so this is a graph, it's chromatic number denoted by chi of H. Um, is the minimum number k such that we can color vertices of h by k colors so that no adjacent vertices receive the same color. Okay. Here's a example. Again, let's take five cycle. It's easy to check that this is five cycle C5 is three. So three color is suffices to color it. Okay, easy to check. No two receive the same color. And two color is not enough. You can check yourself. So the chromatic number is three. And um, so early stone basically says asymptotically, if you forget about this arrow term, asymptotically, the extremal number of H is governed, is governed by the chromatic number of the forbidden graph H. So let's prove this. I hope to finish uh, at least the first proof today. We will give a classical proof, a combinatorial proof. And then we will give a, a second proof, more, more than proof, assuming an embedding lemma coming from regularity lemma. Okay. Ah, I forgot to mention the remark. Right. So let's look at here. A graph is bipartite if its chromatic number equals to two. Okay, non-bipartite if it's at least three. So this is non-bipartite. If this is two, then this one is one. If a graph is bipartite, this is one. One minus one is zero. We only get a little of n squared term for bipartite graph H. That's not much information. So for bipartite graphs, we don't know, we, we don't get much from Erdős stone. And we will see later that bipartite graph, the Turan problem is, is much harder. But for non-bipartite graph, this term is strictly positive. So Erdős stone resolve asymptotically the Turan problem, the uh, extremal number of a graph H for all non-bipartite H. Just a remark. Early stone 
resolve settles asymptotically or determines asymptotically. The extremal number for all non bipartite H. Okay. For bipartite H, we only get a little o n squared as upper bound, which is not so good. We will see later that we can get much better bound. Okay. So let's prove early stone. Mm. Okay. Let's write, let's assume chi of h equals to r plus one. Imagine as the r plus one complete graph that we have in the Turan's theorem. Then this equals to r, the whole thing equals to one minus one over r plus little o one times n squared over two. So we're gonna prove this upper bound. and lower bound, okay? So the lower bound is easy. We can do it immediately. Lower bound of early stone. What does it mean lower bound? So that means we need to find H free graph. Oh, we assume, let's let chi of H to be R plus one, okay? So we assume we need to find H free graph, uh, M vertices, uh, and number of edges with at least one minus one over R minus epsilon N square over two edges. Okay, this is simple. You just simply take T and R, the R part tight one, two, da, 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 or partite, Turan graph. This graph does not contain H as a subgraph. Why? If it does, if it does, that means H can be embedding here. That means H has a coloring. You can give this a color, color one, this is a color two, this is a color R, say. You can color the vertices of H so that none if two are adjacent, they get different color. It's a proper coloring. And the chromatic number will be R, not R plus one. That's a contradiction. Okay. So the harder bit is the upper bound. Upper bound, we need to show the following. What do we need to show in upper bound? Um, where is the upper bound we need to show uh, for any graph if you have for any graph with for any m vertex graph g uh, with at least one minus one over R plus, let me put two epsilon here, N squared over two edges. Two epsilon, epsilon doesn't matter, right? Edges. Then we need to show that we can find a copy of H in G. Okay, this is what we need to show for the upper bound. So that the extremal number is at most this one minus one over R plus two epsilon. Taking epsilon going to zero, you get plus a little over one. And um, let's make it more, let's make the problem slightly harder. So for this, it suffices to show what? And we actually gonna prove something slightly stronger. We're gonna embed, instead of embedding H, we're gonna embed K, uh, T, 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 where this is 
uh, R plus one part. We're gonna show that this is actually in G. Okay, this is what we will prove. So this is the complete R plus one partite graph. Each partite set is T, where let's say T equals to the number of vertices of H. Okay. If we can prove this, we are done because H is a subgraph of that. This is because H has chromatic number R plus one. Yeah, that means you can partition it into R plus one independent sets. Each independent set can go into a part I set of this K T T T T because T is at least as large as the number of vertices of H. This is because chi of H is R plus one. Okay. We will do so by idea is induction on R on the number of parts. Before that, let's um, state and prove a useful lemma that can convert the, the number of edges, lower bound condition, which is the same as an average degree condition. We can convert it to a minimum degree condition, slightly easier to use. So here's the lemma. The lemma says the following. Um, do I have time? I let me state the lemma first. For any zero less than epsilon less than c less than one, okay, then there exists an n zero, which depends only on epsilon and c such that for any n bigger than n0, uh, the following holds. What we have, let um, for any g, n vertices with the number of edges at least c n squared over two, then we can find a subgraph, is this the subgraph G prime, which is induced subgraph actually, on M prime, which is at least square root epsilon N over two vertices, such that the minimum degree of G prime is at least C minus epsilon times m prime. So why is this useful? Well, if originally your graph has cn squared over two edges, this means the average degree of g is at least cn. On average, every vertex has degree cn. Now we say that we can actually pass to a subgraph g prime so that we can have on m prime vertices, then the minimum degree is almost as large as average degree that we had initially. Well, the relative minimum degree, okay? So that means we can directly work with G prime and using this minimum degree condition rather than average degree condition. Okay. Let me postpone the proof of this lemma for now. If I have time, I will mention the proof. For now, let me just write the idea. If I don't have time, this will be a exercise to work out the detail. And the idea is basically keep removing vertices with low degree from G. And eventually it's gonna terminate as some G prime that's as desired. Okay, this is the idea. Try to work out the calculation. Um, so, assuming this lemma, 
Now let's prove this. Remember what we have to prove. We start with the graph. But now you hit, we, we start with the graph with every degree or number of edges condition. We want to embed this complete multi-parte graph with R plus one parts. And let's actually pass from G to G prime, this subgraph where we have minimum degree condition instead by losing, so this is our C, okay, C minus epsilon. So you lose a factor of epsilon, we have minimum degree one minus one over R plus epsilon times N. So root of E Erdish stone Um, using the lemma above, we can pass from G to G prime on some M prime vertices. And this is only needed so that we know M prime is not too small. So if we take N sufficiently large, M prime can be sufficiently large, okay? So the M prime is sufficiently large as long as N is sufficiently large. Okay. And um, um, so we have, without, by abusing the notation, let's assume G prime now is our original graph G. Okay. And we'll write N for M prime. So now we can start with rewrite G for G prime. We start with a M vertex graph G with minimum degree, at least one minus one over R plus epsilon times N. So we have this minimum degree. And our goal, always remember what's our goal, is to embed K, T, 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 R plus one parts in G. And as I said, we're going to use induction. So we're going to do induction on the number of parts So the number of parts, let's call it S. S is somewhere between one part to R plus one part. We're gonna prove that what's the indu induction step that we need to, uh, induction statement, that for any little t, there exists um, N zero, which depends on little t and also S, the number of parts. Right, such that, uh, such that for any m bigger than n zero, and for any g, <laughs> m vertex with this condition, minimum degree condition, we have k t t t t t. S parts, right? Induction on S, S parts in G. This is what we need to prove. Let's look at the uh, base case. Base case is S equal to one. What's a one part type graph with size T? So this is just, this is just independent set on T vertices, empty graph on T vertices. This is trivially true. As long as N is sufficiently large, we can embed an independent set. We don't require any edges, right? Trivially true. Okay. So let's do the inductive step.
inductive that means suppose we have everything true for all s uh, for s and most r right for uh, everything up to s which where s is at most r we need to show um we need to a t t t t t where you have s plus one parts that's our goal right in g okay since we suppose it's true for all smaller uh, ones let's use induction hypothesis by induction hypothesis by induction hypothesis we invoke induction hypothesis that means for any t we can find the s part type k t t t in g so we take this induction hypothesis with different choice of t, and there exists a k um, t capital T t s part in G, where I let t to be this this quantity all over r times epsilon times little t okay and this little t is the size that we want to embed this is v of h okay this is the induction hypothesis now let's write down on part i sets say x1 to xs Let's draw a picture. Oops. So we have x1, x2, da, 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 xs. Each of size, capital T, and this is complete. Complete, complete. All edges in between, k, t, 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 t. Now, we need to extend this guy, take some vertices from each xi, and extend it to a s plus one part graph. Uh, how are we going to do it? So let's call the remaining set of vertices y. So let y to be the set of vertices minus union of all xi. OK. Um, uh, there's a claim we need to prove. Let me state this claim. The claim says, let Z, so we have some set Z here, which is a subset of vertices in Y out of XI. Um, be the set of all vertices with at least um, r epsilon over four times xi. What is this quantity? It's little t by our choice. With at least t neighbors in each xi i in s okay so this is the set of z in picture so you have every vertex here e um he sends at least t neighbors t edges to each xi this is z and I claim that there are many such vertices Z. Z is at least linear 
in the number of vertices of the whole graph. Okay. Now, assuming this claim, let's finish the proof. Assuming the claim, how do we finish the proof? Well, we we can think of each such vertex. You just fix T of its neighbor in each part. So it corresponds to a certain type. This vertex is of this type, right? This vertex adjacent to another T vertices from each another type. But the number of type is bounded. It's only T choose T many choice of this T. In total capital T vertices, you choose little t vertices. This is not a function of t, uh, n. So this is a bounding number. So the number of types of vertices in here is a bounding number. But z is a is lower bounded by n. There are many, many choices of z. So by averaging, by pigeonhole, there is this a huge set of vertices, again, linear in n, that have the same type. Same type means what? They have exactly the same t neighbors in each xi. And collect this set of vertices, together with their common neighbors of size t from each xi, you get a k little t, 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 r, uh, sorry, s plus one part. Proof. Mm. So, each vertex in G, z gives rise to a copy of K1 T T T where you have S parts here. Okay. With the size T part in each XI. Okay. For each one of these, you give rise to a K1 T T T and the number of such types of K1 T T T look like this is limited. Okay. The number of choices for T set X I prime in X I is exactly capital T choose little t. That's the number of choice for each xi raised to power s. You have s of them, right? So pigeonhole implies that at least this many which when n is sufficiently large is less is larger than t many vertices in z sharing the same um this the, the i will not write it sharing the same neighborhood of t vertices in each part collected together you get this gives a K T T T T T S plus one part. Okay. Here there's a remark. If you do this calculation carefully, you will see that actually this proof gives that um, when you have one minus one over R plus epsilon n square over two edges. It actually in, you embed not just um, a kr plus one. You embed a r plus one part tie set each part of size t, and if you solve this, you can take t to be log n. You have a log n blow up size. of kr plus one, okay?
Uh, okay, the time is up. I will prove this claim next time to finish this proof. The claim is not so hard. You can try to think about it. Um, but we will we will prove it next time. Okay. Any questions? So this is a proof where we combine several of the arguments we've seen before. We use pigeonhole here, right? And the proof of this claim is by a double counting. Uh, we've also seen double counting before, and we also use induction. So it's a good combination of all the um, methods we've seen so far.